True Crime South Africa is published in conjunction with Arena Holdings, publishers of Times Live, Business Live, Sowetan Live and others. The opinions expressed in this podcast do not necessarily represent the views of Arena Holdings and its affiliates. This episode is sponsored by the exhilarating new movie, Midnight in the Switchgrass. And let me tell you, true crime fans, this movie is for you. Two FBI agents cross paths with Crawford, a Florida cop who's investigating a string of murders that appear to be related. When an undercover sting goes horribly wrong, Crawford soon finds himself in a twisted game of cat and mouse with the killer. The movie stars Emil Hirsch, Megan Fox, Bruce Willis and Colson Baker, also known as Machine Gun Kelly. And it looks seriously good. True crime fans will be pleased to hear that the movie is inspired by the real-life crimes of serial killer Robert Benjamin Rhodes, who is believed to have killed more than 50 women at truck stops across America. The movie is being released on the 29th of October, and I have three sets of double tickets to give away to three lucky True Crime South Africa listeners. All you have to do is be sure to follow True Crime South Africa on one of our three social media platforms, Facebook, Twitter or Instagram, and look out for the post which will enable you to enter the draw. I know what I'm doing on the 29th of October, so make sure you either book your tickets for the release of Midnight in the Switchgrass or enter our giveaway today. Welcome to True Crime South Africa. I'm Nicole Engelbrecht, and this is your Spotlight Minisode, in which we discuss cases that are in the media at the moment, as well as related topics. Before we get into today's episode, I'd like to thank our new Patreon supporters. A huge thank you goes out to Corneille Elmarie Mall for your support on Patreon, as well as Ilka Zenskirali for your support on PayPal. Thank you so much, everyone. Your support really does make a huge difference. If you'd like to support the show on Patreon or PayPal, I'll leave a link in the show notes. There are now additional ways that you can support the show, with two online businesses providing 10% discounts when you use the code TCSA10 at checkout. You can get your health and beauty needs at King Online, and you can get all your printing requirements designed, printed and delivered by Print Crowd. You can also help to support me as an individual creator by checking out the companion podcast I created with Showmax for the Devil's Dorp documentary, or by purchasing the Krugersdorp Cult Killings audiobook, which I narrated on Audible, Google Play Books or Apple Books. As always, any form of support is greatly appreciated, and it doesn't have to be financial sharing of episodes, inviting your friends and family to listen, and interacting on social media all go a long way to keep the show growing and improving. You can also leave a review on the podcast app you use to listen. If your podcast platform does not have that option, a Google or Facebook review is equally helpful. The following episode may contain sensitive material including descriptions of violence, sexual assault or or graphic descriptions of injuries to victims. If you feel you may be triggered by such material, please consider this before accessing our content. To access trauma counseling or services, please see the helpline information on our show notes. The first case I want to discuss today is one that's just happened, and as a result, there's not a lot of information out in the public domain about it. On Wednesday morning, the body of 38-year-old Liesel Diaga was discovered by her husband in the garden of the premises they were living in. Diaga was a pastor at a church on the south coast of KwaZulu-Natal. She and her husband, Vanna, and two small children had been living on the church premises for the three years that she'd been serving as a pastor there. It is believed that Diaga had been out for a jog with a group of women from the neighborhood that morning, and when she hadn't returned, her husband, who'd been getting their children ready for school, went to look for her. Initial reports indicate that there were strangulation marks around Diaga's neck. Her cell phone and house keys were found close to her body, indicating that robbery was not a motive. 
Her community and congregation have expressed deep shock and grief at the woman's sudden death, and she's been described as the perfect religious leader for their community, with the ability to connect with both young and old in her congregation. Police have confirmed that they are investigating a case of murder. I'll keep my eye on this one for you. In the Nyanga area of Cape Town over the last weekend, a woman was found brutally assaulted and deceased from her wounds. A neighbour entered the home in Brown's farm on Sunday morning after hearing screams coming from the home. She found 47-year-old Zanele Mtwai's bloodied and lifeless body in her lounge. The neighbour then found the woman's son in the house, who admitted to assaulting his mother, but claimed that he didn't think the assault could have killed her. It would emerge that the man had beaten his mother with a pickaxe. When police arrived, they arrested the man, and he will be charged with murder. A community policing forum member indicated that they would try to assist the family in ensuring justice was served for Zanele. The member indicated that they were currently dealing with four other cases of femicide in the Browns Farm area. If you have not yet started listening to the second season of Dion Wiggett's podcast, My Only Story, I highly recommend that you do. In the first season of the podcast, Wiggett told his own story of being groomed and raped by a former teacher. The podcast series, which is set up as an ongoing investigation, would reveal that Wiggett's abuser, Willem Breitenbach, had gone on to rape and sexually abuse many other young men and boys throughout the years, and he'd gone from teaching to working in media, but had seemingly never stopped his predatory behaviour. In the first season, we discovered that after Breitenbach's identity was revealed, he went to ground, shutting down his business almost overnight and fleeing to his mother's home in Hartenbos, where he allegedly attempted suicide. When charges were laid by Wiggett against him, another 15 men would join the charge sheet. Two years later, the case against Breitenbach has yet to come to trial, as his defence attorneys seek out further information about the cases against him, some of which date back to the 1980s. Of course, the pandemic and its resulting delays in the justice system have not been helpful. In the meantime, Wiggett has released the second season of his podcast, in which he hunts down other alleged paedophiles in the South African school system. The season revolves around the suicide of 16-year-old Thomas Kruger at St. Andrew's School in Grahamstown in 2018. After Thomas's death, his father would discover that the boy had been targeted by a male teacher at the school. He was groomed and manipulated into sharing sexually explicit images of himself. The teacher in question has been identified as David McKenzie, who has worked as a water polo coach at several private schools in South Africa. At the time of the release of the podcast, Mackenzie was working for Redham House in Bedford View. When the school learned of the allegations against him, he was taken to a disciplinary hearing for not having revealed the prior police investigation after Thomas's suicide, and he was recently dismissed. Dion Wiggett's podcast, however, continues on as a means to investigating this and other alleged paedophiles in South African schools, and hopefully to encourage people that have been victims of men like Mackenzie to come forward. I am a huge fan of Dion Wiggett's style of podcasting. He's funny and to the point. But more importantly, he is an absolute freaking hero. He has become a voice against a crime that is so often swept under the rug. The sexual, emotional and physical abuse of boys and men. Throughout my podcasting journey, I have become more and more painfully aware of how complex this issue is and how little attention it actually receives.
I first started thinking about this issue when I began to cover some of the many cases of domestic violence where a female partner is the victim. Although female domestic violence victims still have a hard time getting out of abusive relationships, and this dynamic on its own is complex, it is still also two things. It's believable, and it's not a difficult claim for onlookers to accept. Female victims of domestic violence are the stereotype, simply because females are often physically weaker than men, and also because superior male roles are still expected in society. And as such, we find it easier to accept that females may become the victims of men who abuse that patriarchy. When the roles are reversed, it is far more difficult for people to accept. While recent global statistics put the number of women that experience domestic violence as one in four, the same statistic puts that number for men as one in nine. And those are just the ones that report their abuse in studies or class what is happening to them as domestic violence. If we're honest with ourselves, do we expect a lot more violence to be exacted against a man by a woman in order for it to be classed as domestic violence? If a woman slaps her partner or punches him or shoves him, that's domestic violence. But we minimize that, and so do men, because we've taught them to. We've taught them that they don't deserve the same protections that women deserve. Hell, up until recently, sodomy was classed as a separate crime from rape. We've taught boys that they should feel honored when an older woman shows a sexual interest in them, even if they are uncomfortable with that attention even if that older woman is in a position of power. Because boys are supposed to like sex, no matter where it comes from, or what form it takes. So they have no idea they're being preyed on by a paedophile. The different impression of what constitutes rape and domestic violence when the victim is a man pretty much extends throughout most personal crimes. When I recently covered a case on Patreon in which the male victim had been significantly stalked by a female perpetrator and was eventually shot and killed by the woman, several men reached out to me to let me know that they too had experienced stalking on various levels and they had been given very little support. And we know that simply because of the way our laws around stalking are set up, it's already difficult enough for a woman to get protection from a stalker or take any legal action against them. But for a man? Well, let's just say that in the case I covered on Patreon, the man was an attorney. He was intimately familiar with the law, and he had no way to protect himself and ended up with his stalker taking his life. Why? because the courts believed that his female stalker could not be that dangerous. The judge believed her story that she and her victim had been in a relationship and he had betrayed her. This was a complete lie, but she was believed because she was a pretty young female who couldn't possibly have these enormous mental health issues that this man was claiming. Clearly he must have done something to deserve this, right? Well, no, he hadn't. He had just been this woman's attorney in her divorce, and she had fixated on him. And unlucky for him, he met up with a legal system and a public that believed the woman could not be the perpetrator. Really, though, this is not about accepting that females can be abusers. This is about empowering men to speak up and feel like they are not lesser men if they admit to experiencing abuse, whether their abuser is a male or a female. I think that some of the ways we can do this is by not accepting that high school boys are targeted by older women with pedophilic tendencies. We do this 
by not assuming that a man should be able to physically dominate a woman. And when they do, we swing the abuser label right back on them. And in smaller ways, we do this by not joking about dominating our male partners. And we do this by not telling little boys that they shouldn't cry when someone hurts them. While violence against women is an issue I will always get behind, because as a woman, I do know that women are definitely on the heavier scale of domestic and other violence. I really want to start finding ways to encourage men to come forward when they are victims. And most importantly, I want to be someone that will believe them. And I hope that you'll try to be that person too. The last case I want to discuss today really highlights for me how murder is not always the crime we envision when we think of the word. Up front, I want to say that no murder is excusable. Some circumstances may cause a court to find that the taking of a life does not fit the legal definition of murder, but there is still a moral component to the situation which will be viewed differently from person to person. And I think the following case is a pretty good example of one of those situations that almost anyone might find themselves in. A 67-year-old woman has been charged with murder after an altercation with her landlord over unpaid rent, resulting in her landlord's wife's death. It's alleged that the landlord's wife had been in the rented property discussing the unpaid rent situation with the tenant when the landlord entered the woman's home and threatened to switch off her electricity until she'd paid. The man then proceeded to the mains board of the home to disconnect the electrical supply. At this point, the two women, the tenant and the landlord's wife, got into a physical fight. The tenant would later claim that she'd been pushed onto her bed and choked by the landlord's wife. During this time, the tenant managed to get hold of a heavy glass plate and smashed it over the head of the landlord's wife. The woman released her grip, but sustained severe cuts to her throat and bled to death within minutes. I'm certain that the woman will use self-defence as a means of defence in her trial, but it remains to be seen whether she'll be able to prove her case. And that is how quickly your life can change, from listening to true crime to being the subject of it. Before I go, I'd like to introduce you to a new true crime podcast. Coffee and Cases is hosted by Alison and Maggie, and here they are to tell you more about their podcast. Greetings from the Bluegrass State. That's Kentucky, if y'all didn't know. We want to tell you about the hottest new podcast on the block, Coffee and Cases. If you fancy yourself an at-home detective. If you find yourself yelling at the TV during that new true crime documentary. Then you, my friend, are a certified sleuth hound. Just like us. On Coffee and Cases podcast, you'll hear about the missing, the murdered, and the unsolved. But the cases you've rarely, if ever, heard about. All from the perspective of two teacher friends, rule followers, and self-proclaimed scaredy cats. Join me, Allison, and me, Maggie, each week as we take on cases that are often overlooked but are screaming for justice. Finally, a true crime podcast where you don't have to monitor the foul language. Coffee and Cases is a true crime guilty pleasure that you don't actually have to feel guilty about. Check out Coffee and Cases every Thursday for a new episode on your favorite podcasting app. I highly recommend listening to Coffee and Cases, and I'll leave a link to the podcast in the show notes, or you can just search Coffee and Cases wherever you listen to True Crime South Africa. And that is your Spotlight Minisode for the week. If you enjoyed this minisode, please be sure to follow the show on the app you're using to listen right now. You can also follow us on social media. We're on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. I'll be back next Friday with a full case episode. Until then, as always, thank you for your support, and I'll chat to you soon. <laughs>